Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Very excited to be talking about a topic that we just did a live event on. We just did a live event on social media and the attention economy, the neuroscience of well-being, the future of mental health. And now our guest who was on the panel that evening is joining us for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I'm very excited to have Dr. Joseph Vilgas joining us. Thank you for coming on to the show. My pleasure. Really appreciate it. Very excited to be talking to you in depth, one-on-one -on -one about all of this. Mm -hmm. And your background has led you to a very cool place now being nested in this craziness of civilization, figuring out how to use technology and how it affects our brains and so yeah you did lots of work you did a PhD in psychology correct and that was at University of Wisconsin Madison and um, Center for Healthy Minds mm -hmm. as well um, the graduate work mm -hmm. there yep and that was also at in Wisconsin Th that was uh, eight and a half years that's a that's a long time Just a bit, yeah so I did I was in doing graduate training for seven years. I was, did my clinical internship for another year. That's like a year of like full-time training in psychotherapy and, uh, and treatment and assessment. And uh, so then, yeah, so then you put that all together to eight years. It's a long time. Long to, time. To learn how to do science, learn yes. how to do uh, treatment and mental health, work in mental health settings. You, it, you gotta have patience. And it's been a long evolution. You were teaching us about this, about how it went you know, from sitting here on yeah. two couches uh -huh. to, to listening to what somebody had to say about their state of life yeah. to now we're, we have digital therapists, digital doctors, AI yeah. doctors. This is nuts balls in so right. many ways. <laughs> yeah. I think that, yeah, that's what we're going to talk about. Some of, <laughs> it's just how, how much, even since the time I started school, just how much the field has changed already and is going to continue changing, which I think is maybe the, the real yeah. interesting thing to be thinking about and looking ahead towards. Yeah, and that's crazy that you say that because that's, you know, that's only just for you starting. So then we're not even talking yeah. about the kids that are starting now. Right, right. And, okay, um, but before we get to the awesomeness of <laughs> the today's times, let's go to child Joe. How did, oh, yeah. how did child Joe pick up neuroscience, psychology, behavioral sciences? Like, how did you get... Into well, well-being, meditation. You know, to to make a long story short, I it's it, it's interesting. I didn't start out immediately. I might be interested in psychology, or well, definitely not. And still, <laughs> not. Uh, I uh, actually the first the first kind of things I was interested in were natural sciences. So astronomy, physics. I loved doing math as a kid, and uh, and uh, I was really interested in like cosmology, like these big questions about you know, where does it all come from, which you probably relate to. Yeah. And uh, so I, I just would read about, I would read books by Isaac Asimov and yeah. Carl Sagan and those yeah. kind of things. And yeah. then, but there's one thing that's left out of that, that whole picture, which is an amazingly beautiful picture, an incredible accomplishment of human civilization, right? All these models of physics are missing the mind. Yeah. Right? It creeps in, like in quantum, in quantum mechanics, systems behave differently whether they've been observed or not, right? And so that implies an observer and there's something interesting there, right? There's some hint of it, but it's not really, it's kind of missing, right? And so, so pretty much at a certain age, I started getting interested, uh, you know, kind of in high school, uh, when a lot of kids get philosophical, I guess, you know, I started thinking about this and getting really curious about it. And it seemed to me really like the, the one piece that really wasn't, wasn't well understood too. The more I started reading about it, I thought, well, compared to how well we seem to understand electromagnetism. We have no idea what's going on with our minds. Yeah. And then simultaneously, I was also getting to an age where I was gaining awareness of just the state of the world, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. and, and even just what I saw around me and starting to realize that materially, we can have every, every possible material need fulfilled. Certainly, you know, I was lucky enough to grow up in a pretty nice area where you know, people had more than enough materially and yet I saw all kinds of unhappiness and misery around me and uh, so that really impressed on me that the answer you know the answer to human happiness is not going to be a smaller transistor you know like going down to five nanometer transistors or something that's not going to get us out of the, the mess we're in in a certain way and if you look at most of the big problems when I started thinking about it most of the big problems on the planet right now come down to human behavior and human mm -hmm. psychology you know, mm -hmm. 
Uh, and so if we're going to solve any of those problems, we have to make some kind of headway there. And simultaneously, we have no, you know, barely any idea how our minds work. And then, uh, uh, and then if you, if you fast forward a few years, you know, we also have the neuroscience piece come in. I wasn't bad at looking yeah. at ourselves objectively in the mirror. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, I mean, we, yeah, no, none of us want, we don't want to do that. You know? yeah. We're not built to do it, honestly. We're not, we're not designed for that, actually. It's, it's, so we're like going against the grain when we try to take an honest look at ourselves. Um, so I didn't even get involved in, like, um, as, we, as you know, like, I, I, didn't, I worked in tech for a while. I didn't actually get involved in research for quite a while. You were doing uh, software development for like eight years. Yeah, I worked for climate science. I was like science, so I worked for Climate Research Center. I worked, um, I did like some, I, like out of college, I worked on like some just uh, engineering for like, like sonar systems, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also was interested in what it was like to work in the private sector. So I work for a company called Amplify now in, uh, in New York, and they do educational technology. So I like the mission. It seemed like a positive mission yeah. and a great group of people. Um, so I got a little bit of an idea of what it was like to do, you know, to be in that you know, in, in this startup world that we're surrounded by here. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was really interested in, I was, I almost considered staying there, but I really, really wanted to be working with human behavior and psychology. And uh, 10 years ago, it was hard to find a way to do that, which is really funny now because it's like, yeah. uh, you know, that's all we're talking, that's all <laughs> we talk about, right? Is all the social yeah. and psychological aspects of all this technology. But it's like 2008 was a different world, right? So I went into graduate school to, to do my PhD, do clinical psychology, because clinical psychology is about changing behavior, mm -hmm. and it's about well-being. Like, mm -hmm. that's, that's the mm -hmm. core of yep. what we do and the mission yeah. of the field is especially using, using behavior, using um, reflection yes. and insight and things like that, right? Yes. Not necessarily so much of a focus on drugs or yes, uh, yes. So those kind of things, right? But really, how can we actually work with our own minds to uh, to make them healthier? It's and like how does the person that that desires a better life, a better well-being, how do they gain insight mm -hmm. themselves through maybe yeah. someone else that can help them find that insight yeah. and then act on it, right? And then put that insight into practice, so you actually see change in your life, right? That's and so that is what clinical psychologists specialize in, and. And then simultaneously being a techie and being a geek, like I just inevitably fell into the neuroscience side of things because yeah. there's this whole explosion going on in, in studying the brain. And it really brings together the physical side of things, the natural science side of things with kind of the question, these kind of really heady questions of consciousness and mind and philosophy and those kind of things, yeah. You're totally in this, this group of, of, of of, th of thinkers that go to this cosmic perspective and then they understand, oh my God, but we know nothing about our own minds. Mm -hmm. And then you went super, you know, inward to neuroscience and psychology. And, uh, and so I, I love that group, that mm -hmm. group, th those types of thinkers, because they, they get the, they get the, the most the craziest thing, which is consciousness, yeah. and then they also get the insanity of the vastness of the cosmos and the big picture and the small picture microcosms. So I, I really like how you, <laughs> you know, placed yourself there. So can you tell us about your um, your dissertation? In you know, that was that in meditation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. So, tell us. so the Center for Healthy Minds is um, is a center that focuses on um, uh, on cultivating. Uh, um, well-being, psychological well-being, and that has taken a number of forms. One of the specialties is the neuroscience of emotion, so that's been a big focus of my graduate training and my research, understanding what is the neural basis of emotion and what are the, what's the neural basis of emotion regulation, and how do, how do we um, take advantage of those mechanisms, train them, um, uh, how do we um, take advantage of neuroplasticity, the ability of our brain to change and rewire itself over the course of our lives to really bring ourselves to a state of better well-being psychologically. And a big piece of that has been 
uh, mindfulness meditation research. So part of what our center is really well known for is uh, a lot of groundbreaking studies that really opened the way for rigorous scientific research on mindfulness meditation. So starting with studies of uh, Tibetan monks, which you know you probably you might have seen like magazine covers and things like that from you know like the mid 2000s of that stuff, right? So we had Tibetan monks coming through the lab, and we were talking EG electrodes on them. We were talking about this too beforehand about the how funny it is that this has been around thousands of years uh -huh. and now we're bringing the monks into the labs yeah. to get the hard scientific evidence that yeah. oh look at how beneficial right. it is to well being. Well, and interesting it's going both ways you know because there are exchange programs where the monks are coming to the west to learn about biology chemistry and physics right they have the equivalent of like a PhD in you know in the very very rich <laughs> philosophy and psychology yeah. of Buddhism and yet like their training in all some areas where we're really advanced here is totally yeah. Yeah, right. uh, AI know, and yeah, it, biomolecular it, right and, and of those kind of things too even more so right yeah. so so there's a kind of a I think what's happening maybe you could say all over the world right now is this exchange of information where mm -hmm. different cultures different groups of people have expertise the West really needs mindfulness and we have the ability and there's <laughs> I mean, you can just see by the uptake, right, how popular this has gotten. When I started meditating, which was in high school in the 1990s, like, people looked at me like I was an alien. Like, when I talked about meditation, or like a cult, like I was in the Hare Krishnas or something, um, especially where I grew up, which was suburban, outside DC, suburban Maryland, uh, um, like, nobody was meditating. It was not a thing. It was like, it was really weird. It was, or it was like a thing from the 60s, like you had your hippie, you know, yeah. like, your hippie person who like they kind of moved out to the woods and they never came back, you know, and that kind of thing. So the attitude was like so different. And did you it, have a friend that you could talk to about it? I had like really like my one best friend and I got interested in this together. Oh, and, that's good. And it was yeah, like literally yeah. just us. And the funny thing is like we literally we looked up Zen in the phone book. Like in the yellow, the old print yellow pages. That's how you internet. found And others. that's the, how I went to my first meditation center. Oh my gosh. Like there was no Google. You, you, you know? went and looked up and the word Zen in we the literally, pages. Yeah, yeah. And then we wow. like, you know, we went to this tiny little place, a handful of people. It was like so under the radar. Whoa. Yeah. So, but you're right. There's this hunger for it. And it's been amazing to me to just watch it completely explode. Explode, yeah. Since yeah. then. Yeah. And now, like, I can't, you know, I can't turn around without seeing mindfulness <laughs> somewhere. Uh, like we're, uh, and even, even in the settings I'm going into, right, these very kind of almost square you know, hospitals, um, even like the VA hospitals where I was saying I do training, right? Like they are putting, there's, there's mindfulness uh, training, mindfulness-based therapies are like everywhere now. Um, and it's, it's really infusing yeah. things in, with an, an amazing pace. You had, a, um, you had, actually you were going to teach us about some of the, what you were um, doing in your <clears throat> in your dissertation, oh, with right, the, we got results. yeah, we got, and uh, and I actually have okay. some of the um, some of the you know intensive meditation practices linked to slower respiration oh, rate, yeah, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, and then also I just want to just quickly bring up how this was so cool. We'll get to this more yeah. in depth, but this is so interesting how right. it all starts with me right. now in the middle is like this new idea yeah uh, but yeah yeah uh -huh. and i'll just yeah so we just mentioned we were just talking about this is from the department of veteran affairs website yep. and i do i like i i have done this work with veterans where i'm actually but since i'm talking about this i need to be super clear i'm not representing the views of the department of veteran affairs in our talk right that's just a disclaimer i yep. you know have to make yep. um but um but in my personal, like in my work there, um, I, I've had this incredible pleasure of like teaching, I'm teaching mindfulness meditation. I mean, these are like military veterans. These are the guys who have been over in Iraq and Afghanistan, Vietnam vets. Yeah. Uh, like this is, these are not, you know, uh, hippie, t you know, uh, like um, these are not uh, woo woo hippie new age type guys. And, totally. but the VA has bought into this and and, Boom. and working the VA with them has bought into it. Yeah. and they and they they get an amazing amount of, out of these practices and so it's like incredible for me to see this thing that you know that I was doing and and like feeling like I was way out on the fringes with now kind of be so thoroughly yeah. thoroughly integrated yeah. uh, and you can you know we'll get to more of, yes, kind we'll of how this fits more. into where the future yes. of mental health and where it's all going so to, to talk a little bit about my research um, I w I've been interested in mechanisms, uh, 
since I started graduate school, and that's taken a few different forms. Um, in particular, I've been really interested in uh, the way that mind and body come together in emotion. So one of the key things about, um, okay, yeah, so, um, right, so extended mindfulness training is not just training one's cognitive processes, but it also appears to be training and retraining the body as well in ways we're just beginning to understand. So the interesting mm -hmm. thing about emotion particularly is that it's, right. it's, emotion is so all-encompassing. So any change, you, people argue endlessly about definitions of emotion, but one of the ways I think of it is actually as a coordinated change of state across the entire body and mind that's oriented towards a particular goal or a particular type of response to your environment. Mm -hmm. So like when you get uh, afraid, <clears throat> it's like you perceive a threat in your environment, something that you probably can't fight or eliminate and you need to get away from or protect yourself from. And every single part of your body and every single part of your brain is involved in that fear response. So your heart rate changes, your circulation changes, your muscles activate, even your body posture changes, you know, to be more protective. Um, then, uh, and if we look at brain activation, one of the interesting things is people used to look for like a fear circuit or an anger circuit in the brain or a region that would be associated specifically with, and, and every attempt to do that has resulted in the conclusion that, that you cannot limit it to one region of the brain instead what you get Although, like the amygdala plays a big role in people this. yeah so people yes. think of like oh the amygdala is the fear part of your brain but that's not true at all mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's a total misconception but it plays a large role it is very involved but really because the it, more than anything else the amygdala is like a salience detector it detects mm -hmm. what is important in your environment mm -hmm. to tune into mm -hmm. and that can be that that you can see how that's obviously involved in the process you know of, res of a fear response but it's only one little piece, mm -hmm. uh, and there. So there, every but it part of your brain. Doesn't do that tuning into what's salient when it's a executive functioning activity. Oh, it can. It, it can. can. What it, well, what it's doing is it's signaling what we call bottom up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, attention. Yeah, so yeah. So the amygdala is kind of saying, hey, hey, hey you better pay attention to this. Yeah, yeah. Right? And then you can say, no, 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 I know you're saying that, but actually I need to be, you know, I'm supposed to be writing right now, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but sometimes, you, you know, you, you, your glance moves and then you think, oh, oh yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I, mm -hmm. I do need to. So it's kind of like a nudge, right? And our, emotion, our emotional responses are designed to be quick and automatic. So sometimes that emotion response goes along with that bottom-up tension. It's a whole physiological change yeah, that happens. That's the key, yeah. is that this is across your entire brain. Pretty much your whole brain is involved in processing the information and in the, in the response. And then your whole body is involved at the same time, too. And there are feedback loops going back and forth. Your immune system is involved. Your endocrine system, your hormones, yeah. they're involved. All of it is actually happening at the same time. Uh, and by and in training complicated, things. complex ways. Yep. Mm -hmm. Even by training, when you do mindfulness training, meditation as yep. training, you're repatterning the entirety, the endocrine system. You're, we're talking yep. respiratory system. We're talking right. the full body repatterning, yep. not just as, you, as we may have thought, oh, I'm, when I'm afraid, I'm just training to just work with becoming better at when I'm afraid. Yeah, if we try to work with it all up here, we miss, we leave out so much, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and so I was really interested in that from the start. I actually did a little bit of research uh, on looking at different body postures, and I found uh, that um, this isn't something I ever, uh, I've ever published, but, I, but the, um, uh, what I found was actually looking at when people take different fearful body postures or open body postures, uh, it changes their um, response to startle, which mm -hmm. is something that we look at in our field a lot uh, as a marker of actually that amygdala reg regulation of, um, of fear responding. So like when your amygdala is on high alert, then uh, like something like a loud sound will provoke a big startle. And when it's not, um, then then that same sound will provoke a smaller response and we can measure it using electrodes like that pick up subtle muscle movements around your eye. So I was actually looking at how when people change their body posture, do we see basically the amygdala acting like a knob that's turning up and down people's fear response. And interestingly what I found is when you crouch like this, it actually turns that knob down. 
when you crouch down? Yeah. Instead of up like this. You might think, right? Whoa. But when there's a threat, but only when there's a threat present. Oh. Right? So, so when you're responding to your environment, right? And then that response is then feeding back into your brain and changing how you respond. So we've got all these coordinated systems. So the research on respiration really was about, okay, so mindfulness training has all these effects, and I was interested in how much of it is happening psychologically, how much of it is even happening physiologically. And interesting, mindfulness meditation is not a relaxation practice. Right? It's not about just picturing yourself on a sunny beach. It's <laughs> about gaining greater awareness. But then over time, with advanced practice, uh, it potentially does lead to states of uh, calm, mm -hmm. like mental calm. And so over the long term, you know, this is important for our research too because people's breathing affects so many other things. We want to know if when we're looking at, say, uh, uh, heart rate variability, which is another measure of, um, uh, of uh, your emotional state. So your heart rate variability drops when you're under stress or when you're kind of uh, having like a fear response or an adrenaline response. When heart you're relaxed. Variability. Yeah drops when you're relaxed. Yeah, a certain component of it drops. Um, so, so, it, so, it, heart, so heart rate kind of is, it, it, it. When your heart rate, yeah, your heart rate is, has a steady rhythm, but then there's small variations in the beat. Yes. Yeah, and so. The steadier the rhythm, the more stress, you know? Um, that, that's what I was saying, yeah. Basically, yeah, okay. to, in, in okay. a sense, yeah, to, to right? Um, that th there's a kind of variability that we see and the that is my that variable. is controlled by your nervous system and that yes, is responsive yes. to whether you're stressed or relaxed. And the greater the variability, the more relaxed. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's okay. it's yeah. One term is RSA or respiratory sinus arrhythmia. That's a technical term for it. Arrhythmia. RSA is RSA. the easy RSA. one to remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so you'll see uh, more you'll see arrhythmic, a lot of the more yeah. calm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Salud. So, Salud. Um, yeah, so we look at that, and That's even when we're doing deal. brain imaging, right? When people when people breathe this is differently, new stuff, right? The electrocardiograms and stuff. This is new sort of ways to measure. We've had we've right. actually had these measures for a long time. Uh, two couple things have changed. One is we've had the we've had the uh, uh, maybe like say in the last ten to twenty years, we've had enough computing power and cheap enough equipment and all that to just be routinely recording yes. huge amounts of this yes. data, processing it quickly and efficiently and all those kind of things. And then the thing that's really interesting that's changed is now you know you can get like a, a Garmin uh, uh, exactly. band for yeah. running or you can even the through, you, through, your, headband, uh, the yeah, through your phone. Ring. Yeah. Right. And so these things can actually track some of these measures just in real time. So that's that's another interesting frontier I'd like to totally, talk about. Totally. Um, yeah. But so we want to know how much you know how how much of a physiological component is there going on uh, as well along with the psychological component because we're really thinking about well being as something that is a function of your mind and your body together. Yeah. So I'm I'm telling I'm taking forever to tell you about my dissertation work, but but I. Uh, I, then the, another way that I'd be doing that is looking at physical pain, which uh, you might not immediately connect with the neuroscience of emotion. What is that? Pain seems very physical, but actually all the regions and all the brain networks that are involved in processing pain and in your experience of pain are the same ones that are involved in processing emotions, regulating emotions. Mm. And, um, and fundamentally, uh, the actual the experience of pain is a part of it is the physical signal that comes through specialized pain fibers mm. in, you know, that, that innervate your whole body, right? But when they reach your central nervous system, then in order for you to actually have the experience of pain, they actually need to be processed through these emotional regions. And that's part of, that's what makes pain unpleasant, right? Otherwise, it would just be a sensation like seeing the color red or the color green. Interesting. So the the processing of pain goes through uh, areas of the central nervous system, which are uh, emotion. The same key, yeah. So the insula, the cingulate cortex, yeah, front, yeah, areas yeah. of the prefrontal cortex. So um, uh, which is you know kind of these um, where these a lot of this integration is happening. So the insula is a place that integrates sensory information mm -hmm. from all over your body, uh, and especially internal. We call interoceptive information mm. and then um, there's an area called the orbitofrontal cortex it's called that because it's near the orbits of your eyes it's mm -hmm. right kind of in your mm -hmm. behind your forehead here um, and that is a place where you kind of assign 
the values? Is this like when something's in your environment, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? Yep. Um, you have yep. the cingulate cortex that is, uh, some people call it like the, an emotional motor region. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's about deciding, choosing responses, assigning responses. And the ACC. ACC, anterior cingulate and cortex. And that's where right? a lot of our, we can go top down processing through, right? And so, yeah, so then the t what we call top down processing, which would mean uh, directing your attention um, uh, or modulating things. So you yeah. think, you know, uh, I'm overreacting, I should calm down, right? And then you, how am I gonna calm myself down? That, that kind of process, that, when you do that, you're doing some top-down regulation, yeah. right? Yeah, like yeah. this thing happened, like somebody cut me off in traffic, all of a sudden I'm feeling really worked up about it, right? That's the bottom-up process. And the top-down process is like, you know what? I'm gonna rethink this, I'm gonna reframe it. Maybe they're in a hurry, maybe their wife's on their way to the hospital, yeah. I don't even know. There's no reason for me to get angry, I'm gonna get where I'm going. Yeah. That's the top-down piece. Right? Yep, yep. So then we have, you know, we have these prefrontal regions, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Yep. Yep. Um, is a, a region that is known to be important in executive function, executive function and regulating these responses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. So all of these regions are key in shaping your response to pain. So what I did was I looked yeah. at people in a mindfulness-based stretch reduction course. It's like an eight-week training for people who are brand new to meditation. Um, and we also had a control intervention. Right? Mm -hmm. We've talked, we've, we've been chatting totally. a little bit about uh, the importance of um, like sorting out not only why, you know, first what works, but also why things work. Um, I think, you know, things don't always work for the reasons we think they do. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in particular, that's if, why we have controls. You, yeah, 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 if you yeah. study pain, we, particularly we know about the power of placebo effects, which are really the yeah. power of expectation is another way to say yeah, that. Yeah, right? power of expectation. So we want to know yeah. if, we're, if we're looking at that's mindfulness. Cool. Intervention is it really just a matter that everybody's excited about mindfulness? Everyone thinks it's going to work. So of course, like when you think some, you could say that about almost anything, right? So if I think my lucky rabbit charm is going to, uh, you know, make my pain less severe, it will. Mm -hmm. It will because it'll influence that emotional process, right? I'm wearing it versus I'm not wearing it. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we want to know if uh, if mindfulness meditation training is doing anything distinctive or you know or is is it really just indistinguishable from the placebo um or from a, a control intervention that has all the other shared components of mbsr but without the uh without the mindfulness training and there's a reason why places like the va are embodying this as a central theme for helping with yeah. mental health and well-being because it works mm -hmm. right it works and it, 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 so there's a lot of research now um, on mindfulness meditation and mindfulness based interventions that really establishes that it is helpful for a wide variety of condition not every health condition by any means but for certain kinds of uh, conditions so are we getting into your present now? yeah yeah we'll, we'll get yeah yeah so maybe before we get into that then I'll just say you know with with pain to stay with pain for a second what I did was I looked at um, neural biomarkers that have been um, developed using machine learning techniques uh, to really track at a neural level the subjective experience of pain and I, what and were I, the neural biomarkers they're they're like uh, you could think of them as like a map of activation across the whole brain that uh, is a particular pattern. It's kind of like, um, uh, like uh, it, it's, it's like a kind of a lock and key thing. Like it's designed to fit a particular pattern of activation across multiple regions and circuits mm. that will only, it'll only match up, it'll only line up when somebody's experiencing pain. Okay. When people are experiencing other things that might be unpleasant, like, I don't know, like social rejection or, okay, uh, you okay. know, disappointment or something like and that. And it would be a distinct different then, then, signature. Yeah, they'll, the same regions might be involved, yeah. but the pattern won't line up, right? Okay, okay. So you, won't, so you won't see a response in this biomarker. And then you were then able to say that this is the architecture that lights up when pain is. Yeah. Right. happens. And, I, and, and then there's another complementary signature that goes with it that is about... Um, Th that really is designed to track when modulation of pain is happening. So it captures when people are regulating their pain experience in some way or another, using th independent of what they're actually perceiving, uh, or what, what's actually coming in in a sensory way, right? So in this case, it was like heat, like a little hot plate that they're, that's against their skin, right? So we can track 
the, the first marker tracks very closely with what's on someone's skin, and then the second one tracks really well with what's independent of that. So even given the same temperature on my skin, everything being the same in the environment, my pain experience is different. And why, right? Because I had some different expectation mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. um, because I was regulating it intentionally, things like that. Yeah, so yeah. I looked at both of these markers together and I looked at mindfulness-based stress reduction and I looked at um, uh, a, the control intervention. And uh, what I was looking for were differences in the responses between the two interventions as well as differences in the response, you know, in people's self-reported responses. So how much do their, the brain responses that we see track with the behavioral responses, and do they tell us anything different? And they tell us a little bit about the mechanisms involved in mindfulness training as, as they relate to pain particularly, mm -hmm. which is one important area where mindfulness-based interventions have been used for a long time, going back like 30 years, so very yeah. all the way to um, John Kabat-Zinn, who developed MBSR in, in the 1980s. The very first thing he used it for was people who had uh, chronic health conditions who are, or severe health conditions and we're coping with a lot of pain so let's go to present yeah. so we have so yeah. much more to still oh yeah you're right yes. yeah 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 thanks yeah yes. I, <laughs> so much I'll, more I'll yes. go into so much detail yeah. so yeah so 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 bring that to the present so uh, I've been really interested in uh, the mechanisms and, and also um, we have this big world of different treatments so Another question you can ask is, what treatments work for who? So, or, or you can ask, um, uh, how do we get the right treatment to the right person at the right time? Yeah. Right? So That's nowadays, good. That's a good way to put it, yeah. Nowadays we have, uh, we have mindfulness-based interventions, we have like psychotherapy, you know, I do cognitive behavioral therapy mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, we have psychopharmaceuticals. Right? And as we're, as we're interested in talking about, yeah. we even have now this new world of um, we have like um, new novel pharmaceuticals, whatever, you, you know, there are a lot of different terms around. Psychedelic for, like, assistance, psychedelic, psychotherapy. Psychedelic Shout assistance, out psychotherapy. to MAPS, that's we one, love right? you. Yeah, MAPS, absolutely, right? Doing really interesting work that's getting a lot of attention. And um, there's uh, ketamine is another substance yeah. that's being used in treatment of depression now. Um, and they're also now, um, uh, I didn't hear about the ketamine. Yeah, oh, yeah. Ketamine, depression, mm -hmm. yeah, um, MDMA, PTSD. Yeah. About a third of people who have treatment-resistant depression respond very strongly to ketamine. It's a temporary effect. It lasts about three mm -hmm. weeks, um, but it's very powerful. So uh, essentially, you have a lot of ketamine clinics opening up all around the country now, and a lot of research on ketamine, uh, the, and the use of ketamine and the mechanism, right? right? Because the real question, again, it, is it seems to really work very powerfully, but we're not quite sure how. And you um, were talking about mindfulness-based interventions, yeah, kind right. of behavioral therapy. There's and then so we, many. And then we have a class of of treatments that work by um, stimulating the brain directly. So we have transcranial yeah. magnetic yeah. stimulation, right? Yeah, so you use yeah. a magnetic field to actually induce some neural activity in specific yeah. parts of your brain in targeted ways. And you have uh, and deep brain stimulation. very fruitful. It's, the results have been very fruitful. Yeah. So we need better understanding. We have now all of these different treatments. And the thing is like, most of them work, but none of them work 100% of the time, 100% of the way. That's right. That's been like the big sticking point in mental health and psychiatry both for a long time, is, has been like these treatments that are like pretty effective. You know, a lot of them, they do better than placebo, at least to some extent. Um, um, but they, they still leave a lot, you know, they still leave a lot to be desired. So one of the, one of the ways to maybe move forward is, is to really get a better understanding of, of the brain and of how these treatments are working in the brain. So then we can actually target individual yes. processes yes. with individual treatments, matching people to treatments, right? Yes. Like with, yes. with psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, that is not necessarily going to be the right fit for everybody totally. at all times. Totally. And it's a pretty powerful experience. And so totally. it's something you want to be thoughtful about how and yes. when you yes. in recommend it, right? Yes. When in my clinical work, I do a lot of treatment planning, right? Or care coordination, care coordination right? Treatment. Those are the things that we think about nowadays, like yeah. that graphic we had up before. You're literally writing a prescription for mindfulness. Right, That's right. so cool. Uh, that's basically it, yeah. And in fact, we don't want to just write one prescription. We want to put together a whole plan, plan. right? Yeah. You know, like that graphic we had up yeah. before that had all those 
different pieces on it. And now they have all this. Yeah. So, you so this, like yeah. So before we get to that, we wearables can, yeah. to be able to more easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we have so much more data. So so here's what I do clinically, right? We can we can flip back to the lab in a second, right? What we're doing is we're trying to put together a comprehensive treatment plan where we are thinking about um, what's your environment like, um, what's your physical health like. Um, are there relaxation practices you can be doing, you know, spiritually? Um, uh, what's Damn. your nutrition, sleep? So, this, so is, we, this is completely, look at how many categories mm -hmm. you have to pull yeah. and ask and yeah. learn about yeah. in order to make this care plan. You right. have to get to know them like you're their best friend. So Even yeah, we, yeah, exactly. Friend. So we really, it really involves getting to know people in detail and it involves having a great team working in an interdisciplinary way. So it used to be that mental health, psychology, psychotherapy was very siloed. Like psychotherapists would work like out of their living room, right? And and they would yeah, they might never talk to a you have a doctor. You have like a nutritionist right. now on the When team. I go yeah, when I go into the clinics I work in, yeah, we have nutritionists, nurses, psychiatrists, psycho psychologists, social workers who do all you know, home, like if you don't have housing, very Bay Area issue. Yeah. You know, we know that you, you are not, uh, your mental health is never going to be good unless you have stable housing. Um, you, like people who cannot, who don't have a, a roof over their head and don't have safety, shelter from the elements, uh, are, if they have a substance use problem, the chances of them being able to stay sober are almost nil, right? But as soon as they have a roof over their head, that totally changes, changes. the game. Yeah. So we can't treat mental health without yeah. social workers. Right, we need all of these pieces together. So we're taking this much more integrated piece wow. and looking at like all the tools we have in our arsenal. Right, could you be running? Could you be getting exercise? Could you yeah. be eating better? Could you be sleeping better? Um, and then also, wow. right, do we need to be thinking? You know, what kind of medications might help for you? What kind of psychotherapy might help for you? Are there practices you can do to train your mind, like mindfulness meditation or like doing yoga? And can we put this together into a step-by-step -step plan? that all your providers are going to be working on so that you can cultivate the optimal well-being for yourself. And this is currently what you're doing as a postdoc at Stanford. Yeah, so this is like in, in the clinical side of what I do. Yeah, this is, this is how I work. And yeah. it's mostly with VA. So yeah, in, in, yeah, like right now, the clinical work that I do is through the VA hospital. Yeah, yeah one of the VA hospitals in the Bay Area. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And so the a lot of what you're seeing right now is the emotional states, the mental health and well-being of veterans is needs attention, uh, and the attention can be, like you said, so interdisciplinary with the different um, teams of people that are coordinating, getting to know them, and then and then again yeah. writing this right. care plan. Yeah. And so this is happening. How many people do you see then? Um, does like your team, your interdisciplinary team, how many people does it work with? Let's say um, every couple of days, or every month, or how? So I can tell you. This morning, I went to like the the team report, and we had about I don't know between fifteen and twenty people around the table, just checking in on all of the patients that we're working in with in common across all these disciplines. That 15, I've 20 people, people we, on yeah. your team. I'm, on my team just for that one clinic. And yeah. for one clinic. And yeah. then the clinic sees how many? Uh, it, it, it would vary. I mean, so this is, so in this particular clinic, it's like um, we're doing more intensive treatment. So it might be like maybe at a time, like 40 or 50 patients, but we're, you 40, know, we're tracking all of patients. them. Everybody kind of has yeah. a care coordinator. Them over so time. I would be like the coordinator of care for one person. One person and I'm, yeah. my job is to really have this 360 degree picture for them. For them. Yeah. And you have like one or a couple of those right now that you're watching over time. Exactly. Exactly. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And then there's like a strip. Um, privacy with each person's life that you then keep. Um, people that that work in um, in making these care plans keep a very strict privacy. Of, uh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We take privacy very, yes, very seriously. Yes, Confidentiality, yes. right? Absolutely. Like that is that is like the kind of the starting point of everything when you're in a medical setting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 This is a mm -hmm. privacy, particularly with care. with anything to do with mental health. Yeah. Particularly with mental health, yeah, yeah. Yep. Interesting. Now, let's, thank you, Ron. This is good. It's good. I wanted to make sure to get to prepare to die. Prepare. Yeah. Wow. What was is that, that a halfway noise? point? The spaceships yeah. are flying in. <laughs> yeah. I thought I'd won the you know the daily bonus. The daily double. Winner, winner, chicken joke. dinner. Yeah. Yeah. 
And the daily double is yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the mindfulness, yeah. Uh -huh. meaning mi right, mindfulness right. for five hundred. What are yeah. Fruit Loops? I just want to Ron Vogus. This is where we maybe might be segueing into technology. I just want to mention that the, the number one downloaded app that the VA puts, the VA develops some of their own apps, thing, and Whoa. the number one app on the VA is uh, called Mindfulness Coach. Mindfulness Coach. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and that's kind of like the Insight Timer, or the Calm, or Headspaces. It's, it's a whole bunch of tools for yeah practicing mindfulness meditation. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So it's like yeah, Headspace is a really good one that I also recommend to people. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do this. There's a lot to talk about with what we kind of talked about uh, a couple weeks, yeah, two weeks ago or so. Yeah. Um, all right. So what's going on? with the current state of the way that we use technology and our behavior right. with it. Because mm -hmm. from the perspective of someone that is literally studying neuroscience of mental yeah. health and well-being, like what's going on and how the hell do we figure this right. out? Right, yeah. and, and someone who's totally struggling with my own smartphone, <laughs> my own smartphone you know, yeah. addiction and all that. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, uh, I, the way I see this is essentially that we've got something new in our society, in our culture, that we haven't figured out how to form a healthy relationship with, partly because the thing itself is kind of such a, a moving target right now, right? Um, smartphones themselves are, are just changing all the time and what they do is changing, but, but even, even that, just the whole thing is so brand new. Um, and if you look back in history, you know, any time there was a new technology introduced, it created a huge amount of social change and social disruption and some you know often people are excited about it because they, of the things they can anticipate that are really good right but then there's always unanticipated consequences too like if you look at the introduction of the car it made it possible for us to all move out to the suburbs yeah. we, right and then we thought okay now we're gonna it's gonna be paradise, paradise. right it turns out not that didn't quite work out the way we thought, right? Now all of a sudden we're all isolated from each other in our you know twenty five hundred square foot houses. Yeah, right. We never see each other Extra anymore. Shit we don't need. And instead we're yeah. spending an hour a day in the car, and we're not oh, getting we're not walking right. anymore, and we're getting out of shape, and yeah, all kinds you know. And yeah. so all of a sudden there's this whole new class of problems that nobody, I don't think, anticipated when they when you know this was all first happening, totally, right? Totally. And it takes society a few decades to really even catch up with what was happening, put a name to it, and then start to try to figure out, and then all of a sudden you see fitness clubs everywhere, right? Now that we drive everywhere, we gotta have a gym to work out in. <laughs> So, I love Joe's perspective on, on the evolution of, of humanity. He's like, humans go like, paradise, paradise, paradise. And then we get there and we're like, fuck all these problems we made. And then, <laughs> yeah, and then you like go back and like have to like backtrack and try to fix things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so it's just, it looks, the way it looks to me is like, we're, we're going through the exact same thing with, with smartphones, smartphones right now yeah. where, I mean, my smartphone has been life-changing for me in positive ways, right? Like, yeah. I'm a, I'm a, can be an absent-minded person. Like, being able to have my calendar on my phone, in yeah. my pocket all the time is like Fantastic. amazing, right? Yeah. And things like that are so great. Call right? mom on video whenever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? Yeah, like when you when you have family around, right? Yep. The potential to connect people is so great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But then, uh, but then. All these things we haven't anticipated are happening. In particular, the, the big thing that you know that we're, everyone's really noticing now is just the effect on our attention. Yep. And that's because it's such a, a device that's so well optimized to capture our attention, and there's so much on there. And then, of course, as we've talked about too, like the uh, business plans, the, the world of technology, right, has really uh, been able to kind of get a, hand, a hold on human psychology, yeah. right, and really optimize these apps to tune into it. So, so as we talked about, right, this metaphor, it's just like alcohol, right, also, you know, uh, to a great extent, like, uh, most of us in our daily lives are able to walk through a world where alcohol is on sale at every corner, is on offer at every restaurant, right, and, and there are people who do have problems with this, and I don't want to minimize that at all. It's like, it is a real issue, right? But actually, to a great extent, most of us are actually able to um, go through our life without just, you know, sitting down in the corner and binge drinking all Over day. Over 90%, e yeah. Right? And, and the, then the question is, why are we able to do that? So one of the reasons- But it's the opposite with smartphones. The, over 90% of us are addicted. Right, right. Yeah. And so, so 
when you look at, and, and if you look at societies that didn't have alcohol historically when it was introduced, there were huge problems because what did they not have? So they didn't have uh, a good understanding and familiarity of it, and they didn't have mm -hmm. um, good social norms, mm. right? To yeah. help, That's right? Good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in terms of how and when you engage with whatever this potentially yep. problematic yep. Uh, thing is. Um, <coughs> Who's shouting from the rooftops today? Turn all your notifications off. Focus on your creative endeavoring. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And so what you we see is already, yeah. perhaps, you know, very quickly, people are immediately starting to think of, okay, how, what are the ways that we can actually manage this better? Right. Reclaim our minds. Yeah. And there's a systemic piece to it too, right? So like to take another, you know, with alcohol or, you know, to take like cigarettes as another example. But, you know, alcohol is maybe better because it's one that we, a lot of us do want to enjoy, right? And we do want to be able to enjoy a nice glass of wine, right? And have, have a place in our lives. Yeah. So um, what does it take to be able to create that situation? I mean, yes. we do regulate the marketing, advertising yes. of alcohol, right? We regulate where it can and when it can be saw, sold, yeah, yeah. right? Like there has to be systematic. You can't smoke at restaurants or planes anymore. Yeah. Right? You can't sell alcohol to under 21 right. year olds. You can't market cigarettes yeah. to children. You can't market alcohol to children, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Same thing happening with marijuana now, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, you know, about, about. But that's who it's for. <laughs> <laughs> Expanding the minds of 12 year olds. Drugs are for I have kids. to say, you know, I have to say, like, I'm not like a, a war on drugs person, but the research on the effect of cannabis That's on right. adolescent brain development is actually like pretty alarming when you read it. Like, it yeah. really is something. Come that, on, I turned out fine. They don't know what they talk about. Same thing with the alcohol on the, uh, yeah, on, like, yeah. the Russians. It turns or the out, British yeah, and, our, yeah, our brains yeah. are not. Uh, Germans, they're giving you know, the kids the young, yeah. Yeah, they're still developing into our mid 20s, and they're, they're very, they're sensitive to a lot of things at those times so yeah. so it's it's you know it's worth keeping in mind I, it'd be interesting to see what the effects of uh, LSD or psilocybin or DMT are on uh, maybe 18 21 year olds and how that potentially well yeah, that, yeah. That, yeah. That's, but, but I think this gets into yeah. you know I, yeah, certainly from, for another for, yeah, yeah for yeah, another time for sure. as for sure. from the kind of work I do I mean the absolute first imperative is to be doing no harm right we yes. cannot be putting yes. people at risk and yes. should never be encouraging people to put themselves at risk. Yes. So, yeah. so that's that's where I you know that's where I come from in this conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so so the question is yeah how do we develop a similarly healthy relationship with phones? Yes. We need to be there needs to be institutional action. There needs to be action at the level. You do think of, so? Yeah, absolutely. Please, please teach us what your solutions at, from an institutional level would be. Well, I'm not an ex this isn't like the area Give that I'm an expert in, but like yeah. when we were talking last, you know, on the panel, I mean, the, the, really the, the thing I think that might make the most sense is to really think of these things in the same way as we would think of um, any, you know, for mental health, the same way we think of how a product affects your physical health. If, um, if we think that like a food or a drink or a substance might be affecting people's health, we want to do the research. We want to figure out if that's really the case. And then if it is the case, then we need to put in place policies that, uh, that acknowledge that and that, if possible, change the product to, you know, to make it a healthier product. Or if not, uh, we, put, you know, we kind of make sure that we're, we're not drawing people into unhealthy relationships with it. We're putting you know, putting enough checks that people don't get into, you know, that we're not, um, uh, yeah, that we're let's not see, Let's see if a, I can get this right. So, then, so it would be then we go and do the research starting immediately as much as possible on yeah. what the uh, mental health and well-being effects are right now of um, being addicted to, to social media. Right. And then what we do after that is we obviously figure out that there are some negative effects of our behaviors with technology and then we say things like okay instagram you if someone's browsing through the news feed for three or five minutes straight you are now you have to forcibly in your code have to send them a notification that says do you want to continue browsing your news feed or would you like to take a break mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah, and and there are people, and again, there are people who are working, you know, who are doing that, lots and lots of work on all of the Tony strategies. Tristan Harris, Max Stossel, the, um, the Center for Humane Tech, Civility, all these. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, and yeah. yeah, we're very grateful for them. Huge shout out to 
the ethical uh, tech and um, design ethics Absolutely. teams. Yeah. 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 So the idea being basically, you know, if you're it's presuming the something safe, their business plans, which is the hard thing. To well, yeah, yeah. So that's this is where it's important, right? So if you think about, I, I like to, you know, look at Philip Morris as a company. Look at where they are now, right? Mm -hmm. They, it's not in your long-term best interest as a company to to be creating a product that is that damages the health of your customers, right? Yeah. People are going to realize it. They're going to want to get away from the product, and ultimately, uh, also, you're going to be maybe liable, right? There's all kinds of wow. downsides to it. So I you actually would this argue could turn into that. That's so interesting. You know, yeah. and and that didn't happen on you know they didn't just change that on their own, One right? It took it took a lot of public of huge public policy effort. Hundreds of millions of people will be transitioning away from using social media because they themselves will discover the unhealthy relationship. It's already happening, right? Yeah. Everybody yeah. who talks about Facebook is talking about, yeah, you know, I don't really want to be on there, but I, I, I feel like I have to, right? Is that where you want to be as a product? No. Like, I feel like I'm pretty sure Facebook's bad for me, but I haven't figured out how to quit yet. Damn, that sounds exactly like smoking. Yeah, yeah? you're right. Right? Wow. So, yeah. That's very, that, what kind of a horrible, you better transition quick as a social media company if you want um, to, you should, a social media yeah. company could be at the, the, it could be the biggest, they could have the biggest impact on civilization if they themselves were to change their platform away from that and then yeah. they could they could be greatly praised in many ways right so yeah. for the people inside tech that's the carrot right and then for the people who are you know as as citizens right what we can do is keep the pressure on yeah through policy you know through in particular right requiring that the research be done like requiring if you if you're going to be done if yes. you're going to do yes. if you're going to develop a product at this kind of scale right where you have millions or hundreds of millions or a billion users then then you really should be doing research you need to be doing research and making the results public or somebody should be doing research maybe even outside your company right the same way we don't bring drugs on the market without some without some confidence that they're safe, or we don't bring medical devices on the market, right? Yep, um, that's right. Unless, you know, that's right. there's either a presumption of safety or there's a presumption that there's some risk. And if we think there's a risk, maybe we should be requiring some kind of research and requiring the product be designed so that if it mitigates the impacts that it finds, the research finds. Now, do you think taxpayers should be paying for the research, or do you think the company should be paying for the research? So that's an interesting point, and I don't know that I would have, I, I'm not maybe the person to answer that question, because there, there are trade-offs yeah. either way, right? So you either have to have the funding, oh, if they or pay for it, if they yeah. pay for it, then there's the potential conflict of interest. Yeah. But in terms of pharmaceutical research, the ways this tends to work is it is the, the drug companies that do pay for the research with a lot of scrutiny and oversight. Exactly. And that yeah. doesn't solve every problem. It doesn't solve every problem, yeah. But it does, it does yeah. to some extent, work, right? To, a so third party that's not involved whatsoever, has no monetary it, ties whatsoever. It, it creates some, some accountability, yeah. So you have independent, the, the research is done often externally, yeah. And then uh, you have oversight from the FDA, oversight from NIH, and so on. Joe, there's still so much to talk about. Yeah. Um, I feel like you know we've only scratched the surface with mental health and well-being, and what you know what you're working on, and also what society's going through right now with this transition. Like you said, your you know eight years that you went through, and boom, all of a sudden you're done with your PhD, and there's a whole like the younger the people that are only starting are now going through a completely different technology landscape and how Absolutely. that is affecting mental health and well-being. It's just, and how we can actually use it as you were indicating as a tool for good as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, just a couple, just quick questions on the, on the way out. Um, I like to ask these questions on the show. Do you think we're alone in the cosmos? It's a really, you know, I have to say I'm, I'm, I can't. I can't imagine that in, of the entire observable universe, we're alone. No, I don't think we are. Yeah. And what do you think is out there then? Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. You have a big imagination, though. Yeah. yeah. I think. I think that we definitely have a lot of growing up to do here on Earth. We have a lot of before growing we go up off too. trying to find it. That's I think that, that that's my. That's. I used to be really excited about. You know. Uh, 
eat extraterrestrials, and now I'm kind of like, better get our act together. Yeah, here. just mind your business and uh, be a good boy. Let's, let's get our house in order first, good for you. and then go, you know, so, so, and then so. and then go uh, off on vacation. We were we were talking about it right before we started. I'm surprised uh, that it didn't come up in conversation, but I was yeah. like. You know, if we ascribed an age to civilization in terms of maturity, you know, maybe we'd get 10 years old or so, and Joe's like, yeah, you're less than a year old. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're like the flailing infant stage. Yeah. Flailing infant stage, yeah. 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 Um, how about, do you think we're in a simulation? Uh, no, I'm, I, 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 I don't think so. You think this is base yeah. reality? I think that, that that idea is is really biased by the time and place we live in. We just invented the ability to like simulate computers, and we that's all watch right. the Matrix. That's right. So like that's where our mind goes immediately. Just like when people just invented clocks and watches, they thought the universe was clockwork. Oh, that was also something that we got biased towards, huh? Yeah. Watches and clocks, and then we thought everything was like deterministic. Yeah, exactly. Right. Interesting. Because that was like the dominant metaphor. Oh, you know, the, the most dominant advanced metaphor technology was the, the zeitgeist of the age. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's so interesting. Yeah. Ah, so we have a we have a recency bias towards simulation Very theory well because we just came up with these devices that are mag magnificent at running simulations. Yeah. Um, interesting. Interesting. <laughs> Cool, cool. I like that. That's the first time we've heard that recency bias towards the towards it. Um, and then, last question is: What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Mm. Wow. Hmm. I think the the most beautiful thing in the world is actually any moment when you are fully present and fully accepting and fully, uh, and, uh, I mean, I want to say a piece, it's kind of cliche, but, but what I really mean is that you're not trying to change anything in that mm. moment, you're just completely, you're completely there with it. What do you feel when you feel that? I feel the most beautiful thing in the world. You do, yeah, that's so good. That's so well said. Well, uh, some, we really urge everyone to do their best to do what Joe just said as often as possible. That, was, that was so well said. That's at the heart of mindfulness training. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful episode, beautiful conversations. I feel so blessed that we are friends. Oh, that's so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Ending sequence music. I hit the wrong commencing now. There we go. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Joe. This yeah, was no such, pleasure. such a pleasure. So much fun. Yeah, we I really appreciate you and what you care about and what you're building. So keep it up. Keep up mm -hmm. the good work. We have lots of cool people to connect you to and connect us to and let's keep featuring content like this. Yeah. With smart people like you. Yeah. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Give us your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear about how you yourselves are working on mindfulness, on meditation, on ethical tech, and your relationships with it. Teach us about it. Let us know in the comments below. Uh, also, huge thank you, Ron, for producing and directing. Much love again, everyone. Go and manifest your destiny into the world. Build the future. We love you all. We'll talk to Thank you good. soon. Peace.